Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, your home for the most detailed motorcycle reviews on the net. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and if you're new here, I hope you'll consider subscribing if you appreciate this kind of content. Now, Ducati is not the motorcycle brand that comes to mind when you think of off-road motorcycles. However, if you were around in 1990, you might remember that a company called Kajiva actually won the Perry Dakar race with a model called the Elephant 900. And if you can believe this, Ducati was actually owned by Kajiva at the time, and that bike used a Ducati engine. Now, of course, since then, the motorcycling world has changed a lot, especially with the rise of the adventure motorcycle movement. And Ducati has been inching closer to off-road adventure bikes with models like their Desert Sled and, of course, their Multistrada. Ducati's brand new Desert X. This is Ducati coming out with full guns blazing. Everything from the high-spec long travel suspension to the amazing ground clearance to the incredibly awesome, in my opinion anyway, uh, Dakar inspired, inspired styling to the amazing suite of electronics, all the accessories available, the competitive weight and power figures, actually the most power in this class, all that is to say, Ducati is not messing around with the Desert X. Now, before I go any further, a huge thanks to Ducati North America and the PR manager there, Alex, who have set me up to be one of the first journalists in the USA to really get their hands on this bike for some real world testing outside of the press launch. Huge shout out to you guys. Thank you for making this possible. So here's what you can expect in the video today. I'm gonna show you the riding position of the bike, including with the passenger. We're gonna do my famous drop and lift test. Then we'll cover the specs and take you on a tour around the bike to show you the features and the design. Then we'll get it out on the highway, on the twisties. We're gonna take it in the dirt and see how this thing really rides. Then of course, we'll come back here to discuss maintenance and ownership concerns or issues. We're gonna discuss the pros and cons of this bike. We're gonna talk about how it compares to the competition. And then finally, we're gonna have some final thoughts. This is gonna be a deep dive into the Desert X. This is gonna be much, much different than the press launch videos you may have seen out there already. So go ahead and if you want, take a pause right now in the video, get your favorite snacks or drinks ready and get ready to learn everything about this Desert X. All right, let's take a look at the riding position and the seat height of the Desert X. Now, just real quickly, my specs, I'm about five foot 10, 70, 70 inches tall, about 180 centimeters. I weigh about 200 pounds or about 90 kilograms and have a 32 inch leg inseam. So the seat height of the Desert X is 34.4 inches, which is really competitive with all the bikes in this midsize adventure category. But the Desert X still feels pretty tall. I mean, as do all of its competitors. Let me show you what I mean. So even at my height, so I put the kickstand up. If I put both feet down, this is how the seat spreads my legs out. And you can see, I can't really, I can almost flat foot. If I move my butt over to one side, I can flat foot on one side. I never put both my feet down when I come to a stop. That's just not what experienced riders do. Uh, but I can tiptoe on both sides. The bike is fairly tall. So you're gonna have to keep that in mind. It's not really short rider friendly. Now, they do offer, first of all, they offer a higher seat if you want more leg room which I think is around a 35 inch seat height, or you can get a seat that's about three quarter inch lower, bring it somewhere around 33 and three quarters, 33 and a half. And what they have is a pretty affordably priced low suspension option. So they sell you different springs and they'll put them on to lower the bike about another inch to half inch. So you can get that seat height down pretty low around 33 inches if you're somebody a little bit shorter uh, and you still want the Desert X. In terms of the riding position, you can see it's classic adventure bike riding position. The bars come up to meet your hands very nicely. Your body's in a perfect position to be comfortable all day and to have good control of the bike. All right, so let's show you how the bike is with the passenger. So I'm going to have my wife Maggie jump on here. So let me mount up real quick. Okay, okay, Maggie, why don't you go ahead and jump on? Are you ready? Yes. Just ignore the small child in the foreground here. Okay. Mommy's okay, mommy's testing the motorcycle with daddy. 
Okay, so why don't you talk about sort of the, the seat and where you can put your hands and just how you feel back there. I mean, the seat feels a little bit narrow, but I am not, I don't have a lot of experience riding motorcycles. But over, it seems, yeah, it's comfortable. It seems a little bit narrow, but it still feels comfortable. There's a handle back here that I can hold on to. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you'd be comfortable riding this for a couple hours, but maybe not all day, it sounds like. Correct. Okay. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Okay, you're welcome. All right, this is a very important test for adventure bikes that not enough people do when they do the bike review. So, drop and lift test. So, I put down a blanket. I'm using a soft surface of dirt and wood chips, so making sure not to do any damage to Ducati's very pretty bike. Uh, Alex, if you're watching, no scratches. Um, so, what we're gonna do is I wanna show you kind of how it falls over, how it's resting on the engine guards, where it's impacting, and then I'm gonna kind of show you how difficult or not it is to lift. So first, let me grab the camera and kind of show you where it's resting on the frame, on the engine guards. All right, so from this angle, I'm holding the camera here, you can see how the bike is resting. It's kind of resting on the passenger foot peg in that bracket, the driver foot peg, and then this, this factory accessory engine bar, which actually seems to be doing a very good job of supporting the bike's weight. And it's also resting some weight on the handguard and handlebar, but that's gonna depend on kind of what angle you have the handlebar at. I did notice that in kind of setting this up, that there's a lot of flex in that plastic part of that, of that uh, handguard, and I wouldn't trust that in any sort of real life situation. So bark busters or a metal wrapper on handguard, I'd recommend if you're gonna buy this bike. So let me put the camera back on the tripod and kind of show you how this thing is to lift. Now there's different methods to lifting motorcycles. There's videos out there on that. However, the main thing is protect your back. Keep your back straight and don't lift with your back. If you find your back being bent or hurting at all, stop what you're doing. So I'm gonna do kind of this method. One thing that's challenging with this bike is there's, there's not like a grab handle here for the passenger. It's kind of back here. So I'm finding it's a little bit difficult to find a place to kind of uh, hold onto here and lift this thing up. So this time I was uh, thoughtful enough to put the bike in gear and have the kickstand already retracted. <laughs> so make things a little bit easier. Um, I'm out of breath. This bike's heavy. It's 500 pounds, which is competitive in a segment. But because it wears its weight kind of up here, I think it's pretty hard to lift. It's definitely harder than my KTM 890 or something like a 790. Um, I'd say it's real similar to like a Tenere 700 or Tiger 900, it's, it's gonna be difficult to lift. You're gonna have to have some strength and some practice and maybe have a friend help you. So if you're gonna ride alone into the backcountry, uh, practice this at home first before you go out to, to make sure you're gonna be able to lift it up. All right, let's cover the specs and take you on a tour and walk around of the Desert X. So let's start with pricing and the weight. So in the USA, this bike is coming in at 17,000 095 that for this model year. Now keep in mind that's a base price, doesn't include some of the accessories shown. We're gonna talk about that in a second. In terms of weight, because everybody wants to know the weight. So the weight is right around 495 pounds or 224 kilograms. That's with the full tank or five and a half gallons of fuel on board. Now, as we look at this bike and take a tour of it, keep in mind that this bike has a couple of extra packages on it. The first is going to be the Termignoni exhaust. This exhaust here is actually a $2,000 add-on. So really a very expensive, but very nice exhaust. Honestly, if it were me, and you'll see this during the riding, I don't think I would pay for that because it doesn't add a whole lot of sound and it's still pretty quiet. Although it certainly does give you that bling factor. The other additional extra this bike has is the off-road protection package. So what that gives you are these crash bars, which I could swear, I would bet money these are made by Touratech for Ducati. They also have a skid plate. They actually did a really nice job with the skid plate. It kind of mounts uh, to the frame and it's done in a very nice way that I don't see many manufacturers do. So you get the skid plate, the crash bars, you get this radiator guard and you get hand guards. You get improved hand guards, which are metal here, but plastic here. So if you see that, that's a poor design, honestly, because this plastic part is going to take the stress and probably snap when you drop the bike or have any tip overs or accidents with it. Here's that water pump guard I was talking about. So that's to guard this kind of exposed water pump here. 
So what do you have to pay for this off-road protection package? Well, it's a $1,500 US dollar package for all that stuff. Now that sounds bad, but really if you were to buy a lot of the stuff aftermarket, it can add up pretty fast. So I don't think it's terribly out of, out of range for a package like this. So that brings the as tested price of this test bike here to around $20,500 US. So yes, it's definitely getting up there in price. However, keep in mind, if you buy one of the other bikes and you start adding crash protection and exhaust, you're not gonna be too far off this figure. So just keep that in mind. Now let's start with the specs talking about the engine. So it's Ducati's 937cc Testa Stretta 11 degree engine. So it's a 90 degree, meaning the cylinders are arranged like this at 90 degrees from each other, uh, V-twin engine configuration. Four valves a cylinder, liquid cooled of course. And in terms of power output, you're looking at 110 horsepower or 81 kilowatts at 9,250 RPM. Uh, that's a high compression engine, 13.3 three to one, so you do need to use premium fuel. And for torque, you've got 68 foot pounds or 92 Newton meters, and that comes in at 6,500 RPM. That's all hooked up to a slip assist clutch, uh, wet multi-plate clutch, obviously, and it's a hydraulic clutch, as you can see up here. I really, really love and appreciate the fact that they put went to the expense to put a hydraulic clutch on the bike. It has such a better feel uh, and quality than a cable clutch on a lot of the competition. So finishing up our drivetrain tour here, you can see that it is equipped with a quick shifter. That quick shifter is standard and it works very, very well. It can be a little bit notchy or a little bit kind of, you have to use quite a bit of pressure and we'll show that in the ride, but I think they did that on purpose. And of course, chain final drive. Let's talk about suspension on the Desert X. So you have KYB suspension. They're a very high quality, very well-known suspension company. So they're the ones that did the suspension for this bike in coordination with Ducati. You have 46 millimeter front fork. It has nine inches or 230 millimeters of travel. And you have full adjustments for uh, compression and rebound damping. So good quality suspension. And we're gonna show that when we go ride the bike. For the rear suspension, it's also done by KYB. You have just under nine inches of travel or about 220 millimeters of travel. You have an HPA or hydraulic preload adjuster here. So you can easily crank in more preload if you have a passenger or luggage and you do have full adjustments for damping as well on the rear shock. Let's talk about the brakes. The brakes are very impressive on this bike, as you would expect from Ducati. You have twin 320 millimeter front discs. You have twin four piston Brembo monoblock M50, uh, I think they call these the Stylema calipers. But anyway, what you need to know is they're super powerful and have super good feel. Some of the best brakes I've ever used on any motorcycle. The rear brake, of course, is also coming from Brembo and you have a twin piston caliper and a 265 millimeter rotor. What about the tires and wheels on the Desert X? So they went full off-road with this setup. So you have a 21 inch front wheel. It's tubeless and it is spoked. You can see the spokes have an external design, uh, very similar to what a lot of bikes are using, like the BMWs use this, the Harley Davidson uses that, a lot of bikes do, Africa Twin as well. And on the rear, you have an 18 inch rear. So these are very off-road friendly sizes. A lot of good off-road rubber included, uh, or is available, I should say, for this bike. Now, you get these Pirelli Rally Scorpion STRs, which look kind of knobby, but they're actually like an 80-20 tire, 80% street, 20% dirt. Uh, they're very, very good on the street, have excellent grip, as you're gonna find out in a minute. And off-road, they're marginal, acceptable maybe, but not great off-road, if I'm being honest. Couple more things to cover if we've missed it already. Uh, fuel tank is five and a half gallons or about 21 liters of fuel, which is good for a range of around 200 to 250 miles. I tend to average around 50 miles per gallon. That's US gallons, US miles uh, with this bike. So I'm getting that 250 mile range. And we should talk about the warranty. So the warranty on the bike is depending on the country you live. In some countries, this comes with a four year unlimited mile warranty, which is amazing. But here in the US, as I suspect many countries, you're getting a two year unlimited mile warranty, which is still good, but not exactly class leading. Okay, it's time we take a tour around the bike, show you the interesting features and design aspects of the bike. So one thing that's really kind of stands out about this bike are these running lights, these LED ring lights here. They look amazing, give the bike a very distinctive look. You also have LED turn signals. We've talked about suspension and brakes. We've uh, you've got this radiator here, 
where you would expect it to be. The windshield is a fixed windshield. They should have done an adjustable windshield in my opinion. We'll get to that a little bit later. We've talked about these are the optional accessory off-road handguards, which I probably wouldn't get just because I don't think they're going to be super strong, although I can't fully test that without abusing the bike or crashing it, which I'm not going to do. Uh, moving around to the side, you can see the large fuel tank here. Fuel tank is made of metal, and of course you've got these plastic fairings. Everything feels extremely solid. Nothing flexes, nothing rattles or feels cheap. It feels like it's extremely high quality, everything you look at. Coming around to this side, we've talked about the engine already. You can see the frame here. The frame does have a detachable bolt-on subframe. The passenger pegs are also bolt-on in case you were to ever damage anything here. Uh, we talked about the uh, upgraded off-road skid plate, which I would get. I think that's a nice design, how they mounted that in here into the frame. Now, brake lever. Look how strong and sturdy this brake lever is. And plus, look at this. You've got two positions. That's the high position for off-roading when you're standing up. That's the low position for when you're uh, sitting down on the bike. Very, very nice design. The foot pegs, I wouldn't even have to replace these foot pegs. You could save money there by not having to upgrade them. I love that Ducati gives you these right out of the off the factory floor. You can see some of the rear brake stuff here. Passenger pegs, also metal. We talked about this is not the stock exhaust. This is the optional exhaust, which is quite expensive. Although I have to say very nicely made. Coming around here to the back, you can see the license plate holder, which is extremely sturdy. It's actually on this metal bracket. The whole rear uh, fender assembly is very sturdy. It's very slim and kind of minimalist. You can see this sort of grab handle back here. Uh, now, I don't want to get it too far into this, but if you want to attach luggage or take passengers, some of this can be a little bit minimal and you might need to uh, attach stuff to this area. And it looks just looks a little bit thin in terms of how it might support luggage. Also, this is a good time to mention, and I'll put a photo of this here. Ducati offers a rear tank, which is kind of a distinctive feature that they've been advertising for this bike. It adds, I think, eight liters or about two gallons. It costs $1,500 and it goes on here, um, but it could potentially interfere with putting on luggage racks or using rear luggage, depending on what kind of luggage you use. So you're definitely gonna have to keep that in mind. And frankly, I don't see much case for that large fuel tank since this bike already can go 250 miles on a tank of gas. So be that as it may, let's move on. Coming around here to the back, kind of a distinctive uh, tail light in the back, kind of like the design on that, LED signals as well. You can see the chain cover here drive chain, rear wheel, everything back here as you would expect. You can see the shifting mechanism here. I don't see an easy way to adjust this. I think it's something to do with this shaft here. And there doesn't, they don't tell you how to do that in the manual and that's something that's kind of upsetting. The manual basically doesn't tell you how to do anything. It just says go to the dealer. And we're gonna, we're gonna cover that later because that's something that I don't like. Uh, we talked about this optional water pump guard. You can see this side of the engine here. And I think that's about it for this. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and move the bike into the garage and to give you a better sense of the electronics, it'll be easier to see the screen and show you how the controls and the dashboard work. All right, so I'm gonna give you a tour of the controls and how the TFT works. But before I do that, I forgot to mention in the tour, the bike comes equipped standard with this steering stabilizer. Now, it's not adjustable. It's not like some of the fancy off-road ones you see on off-road bikes like Scott steering dampers or stuff like I have on my, on my personal bikes. But it's nice to see that and it increases the stability of the bike. So good job on including that. Let's take a look at the controls first. So adjustable clutch and brake levers, just like you would expect. We'll start over here at the left-hand switch gear. You've got, um, this is to be controlling the menus and the modes. I'll show you that in a second. You have a hazard light switch here. This is an ABS switch. I really like they give you a dedicated ABS switch to turn ABS on and off. You have cruise control here, which works very well. Of course, turn signal and horn, which is actually fairly loud. Uh, you've got a dedicated button for heated grips. My bike does have the heated grips, which I forgot to mention. That's also additional cost on this bike. It doesn't come with that, but I do like having the de dedicated button. Then you've got the stop start slider switch here, engine start button here, and this is to control your daytime running light or headlight, turning those on and off manually. So now 
Oh, and also the mirrors. The mirrors are these round mirrors. They look a little bit maybe old fashioned in some way, but they're actually very well made and, and they give a very nice view behind you. All right, so now I wanna show you uh, what to expect from the TFT and the riding modes. I'm not gonna go through every single thing because it'll take forever, but just real quick. So to, to cycle through riding modes, let me position this so you can kind of see it. So to change the modes, you're gonna go and you're gonna hold down this mode button here. And when you do that, then it's gonna to come to a menu and you're gonna be able to choose between your riding modes. Now, all of these modes are customizable for traction control, ABS settings, throttle response, how much power you want. You can customize every single one of these, which I think is an amazing feature. Most bikes don't let you do that. So, for instance here, if I go into the touring mode, to select it, I hold down that button again. So the button I was holding down was this button here. Now you can see it says I'm in touring mode and it shows me my settings here, wheelie control, traction control, ABS, engine braking. You can also configure the engine braking. So if you did wanna configure your modes, what you do is you go in here to the setting menu, you go into riding mode, you could go into the mode you wanna customize and then you can select uh, how you want to set this up. So power lets you choose between, I think it's 75 horsepower and 100 horsepower, um, but you also can change the throttle response. Here you see dynamic or smooth throttle response. So anyway, let's go out of that. Now one complaint I do have is they didn't give you a dedicated back button. So to go back when, you, when you're done doing what you're doing, you always have to navigate to back and then keep doing that. It's kind of annoying. They should have given us a dedicated back button, but I know I'm being super, super picky here. So let me select the rally mode here. So we'll go into rally mode and you see in rally mode, the dash changes entirely. And in rally mode, it's preset. It turns off wheelie control. It turns down your traction control. It has the ABS off to the rear wheel, but on, on the front wheel, it has moderate engine braking. So and you can configure all that, of course, as you want. Now, one thing I would have liked to seen, which would have made it just perfect, would be to be able to change the traction control on the fly. So on my 890 Adventure, one thing I love about it is in rally mode, I can go between levels one through nine of traction control with the button on the handlebar as I'm riding. This you'd actually have to go in and do that in a menu. It's not too big of a deal, but it's not quite as well implemented. But they do let you customize everything here and the electronics work very, very well. So in the rally mode, you can see, you kind of have a different setup on the screen. I'm not gonna go through all this, but um, it's really comprehensive what you get. And for navigating rallies, you can do trip computers, you can do stopwatches and timers. So they give you a lot of different uh, features. This is a very nicely featured TFT. If I go back to the touring mode, uh, then you can see the basic screen is I've got a fuel gauge up here, I've got the clock, I've got a big tachometer, some indicators in the middle, gear position indicator, uh, speed of course, uh, all my settings for my electronics, then I've got range trip computer down here, air temperature, a water temperature, headlight indication. Now if I want to go and select stuff down below here, I simply hold this arrow down. Now I'm in the lower menu and I can go through here and select what I want to see in terms of miles per gallon or trip computers and things of that nature. All right, what do you say we get the Desert X in its home environment, the dirt? So this is actually gonna be a really long uh, trail that I'm gonna be doing. I'm not gonna show you the whole entire trail because it would take like 30 or 40 minutes. I'm gonna show you the best segments. So to get started, let me show you what I'm gonna do to the bike. So I was riding the bike in sport mode because I was on the highway. So what I'm gonna do now, and you can do this while you're moving, you can change the ride modes while you're moving, but you can't totally deactivate the ABS while you're moving, that's the difference. So to change the ride modes, you hold down the bike here and then we're going to go ahead and I've kind of showed this in the other part of the review so I'm not going to go through this too much so you've got enduro and rally so enduro is going to give you that reduced 75 horsepower down from 110 horsepower it also has a, a, a moderate amount of traction control it still lets you slide quite a bit in the dirt and uh, the throttle response is set a little bit more gentle uh, than the rally mode so we'll start there and then we'll go to the rally mode to show you kind of the difference so I'm going to go ahead it for now, and I'm going to leave the ABS engaged. It's an enduro mode ABS, so it's less intrusive, but it's still engaged. And then I'll turn it off to kind of show you the difference there. So let's go ahead and uh, get this thing started. <laughs> All right. 
right so I've ridden this bike off-road before this one not not my first time doing it now what do you notice about the Ducati Desert X in the dirt uh, the couple things strike me right away it doesn't feel like a big heavy adventure bike it feels more like a KTM 790 or 890 adventure or even a KTM 690 or a smaller lighter weight bike it it doesn't feel top heavy you can if you're an experienced enough rider you can jump on and ride the hell out of this thing right away. It's just so uh, well engineered for doing this. The suspension is firm, but it's compliant uh, at the same time. Uh, you can slide the bike. Uh, the electronics work amazing. So let me talk more, a little bit more about... I also want to say I love the clutch on this bike. It's a hydraulic clutch. Uh, the engagement is really great. And the gear shift, of course, is super smooth as well. So in the enduro mode, I definitely can notice that reduced power. So I've been giving it full throttle and it's definitely noticeably slower, but they do that because it's kind of hard to use 110 horsepower in the dirt. All right, let's go to rally mode. So now things are going to get serious. Now I know what you're thinking, these roads are kind of open and straight and don't have many obstacles. Well that's going to change here in a minute. So in the rally mode I definitely notice the full throttle is now active, I mean the full power is now activated, all 110 horsepower. But the, the traction control is still a little bit uh, too, too much for me. So what I'm going to do is... <laughs> the bike slides pretty predictably. Now the tires I've got are the stock tires. They're not that great in sand, so I have to watch myself a little bit. Yeah, boy! Okay, I'm liking this setup now. Traction control level two is my friend for sure. It's also gonna depend on what kind of tires you're running. So I am noticing that one thing I noticed with the suspension after I've been riding it a little bit harder now and through some of those bumps, uh, bigger uh, hits, is that the I do I have bottomed the back suspension, the rear shock, a number of times already. So it definitely will start to give you some uh, give you some feedback if you start to push it too hard. It's it's still a 500 pound bike and a suspension. Oh, that's very rocky. This thing is so planted. You know, you can just plow through, plow through these rocky areas. And it just, I think it has something to do with the rake and trail and the wheelbase. The bike is extraordinarily stable. It's even more confidence inspiring than my KTM 890 Rally. I think it has to do with that rake and trail number in the wheelbase. And the suspension, I really enjoy it. It's very plush. Uh, and fairly supportive until you start riding at a really elevated pace. Uh, see, I'm riding a little bit too fast and I'm not even standing up, which I should be standing up. But the bike just takes it. And when you do bottom the bike out, it's still, it, it bottoms out pretty softly. It doesn't give you like a huge, you know, a huge crash or anything. The bike just magically doesn't feel heavy. It does not feel anywhere near 500 pounds. I, the Tiger 900 is also 500 pounds, the Rally Pro. This bike feels, no joke, like 100 pounds lighter than that. I, I can't tell you why, but it just does. 
Now I haven't talked a lot about the engine for off-roading. So for off-roading, this engine is also great. The power is very linear. It's very smooth. It's a creamy delivery of power. You can rev it out when you want to, but if you lug the engine down here, like third gear, 2000 RPM, it doesn't chug or do anything weird. Uh, this, this 937 Testa Strut engine with the Desmo valves and everything, it's, it's a great, great engine. Okay, I'm gonna stand up and ride through some of this stuff here. I know, I think it gets a little bit sandy up here, if I remember, and the rocks start to get pretty, oh, I'm good, I'm glad I have a skid plate. Oh boy, there's the sand. Actually, pretty planted in the sand, considering these tires pretty much suck for off-road use. Oop, hit some big rocks there, take a bad line, plow through. You could just plow right over big rocks and loose terrain with a spike. It's it's un it's almost unflappable. It's so so stable and composed. I'm super impressed by that aspect of it. Now, the slow speed control, if I let the clutch out here, it's about eight miles an hour. So I've got my hand off the clutch, my hand off the brake, and I'm just letting the bike idle as I do this. And it doesn't want to stall. Now, if I want to ride super slow, and do, so, I'm leaving my feet on the pegs, try not to touch the ground go very tight circles so one thing I like is well number one this is extremely easy to control with the clutch the bike feels extremely well balanced like it's not doesn't want to tip over at all like most adventure bikes do uh, plus what was I gonna say oh the steering lock look at the steering lock on this bike it's unbelievable it's like an Africa twin or even better than that way better than most bikes I mean look that's a tremendous steering lock. That's great. Fan finally came on. Now, I haven't been noticing. So I'm wearing the Revit off-track suit, which uh, is an online suit. It's not Gore-Tex or anything. I don't notice any undue engine heat. It certainly runs cooler than my KTM 890 does. It doesn't seem to have the engine heat of that bike. So I would give that a good rating so far. Can Desert X pass the school bus? <laughs> yeah, it can pass the school bus. Third gear ought to do it. So cruising at 65, 70 miles an hour. There is quite a bit of wind noise and a decent amount of buffeting with the Desert X. I would like to see a more aerodynamic windshield or an adjustable windshield or something. It's not the worst bike I've ridden for buffeting, but it's definitely not the best. In terms of engine smoothness and, and uh, sort of vibration, there there is none. You can feel maybe the tiniest bit of vibration maybe in the seat, but not very much. The, the handlebars are absolutely smooth at these speeds, 75 miles an hour. Uh, the RPM, so at 70 miles an hour, the RPM is 5,000. At 80 miles an hour, you're at just under 6,000, but there's still no vibration. Also the mirrors, you can see out of the mirrors, they're very clear even at 70 or 80 miles an hour. Very little vibration in the mirrors. These uh, 90 degree V-twin engines, they tend to be very smooth on the highway. All right, so let me show you the cruise control on the Desert X. So it works really well. You've got an on-off toggle switch here. When you turn that on, you see the little indication light up on the TFT. And then you simply push the down button to set it. And it shows you what speed you're set at and you can increase in one mile an hour increment. So it basically works just like you would expect, but it works very smoothly. It's very good at holding your speed and, it, and it's a very seamless system. It doesn't like speed up going downhill or lose its speed going uphill. Like, I don't know why, but my KTM 890 is really bad with that. So. All right, so how does the Desert X do for sport riding? So twisty paved roads, riding aggressively. How does this thing stack up against its competitors? So let's go ahead and uh, get this thing fired up. So we're going to put the bike into sport mode. You guessed it. So sport mode is going to give us the most throttle response, most aggressive.
Okay, let me slow down my pace and my heart rate a little bit here to tell you what I'm experiencing. So, it's a Ducati. Did you expect them to make a bike that was not going to be amazing on this kind of road, right? That's what Ducati does. And that Ducati sport bike DNA, that race winning DNA, is injected into this Desert X. I think I would say that, and you can see this as I'm riding, and I've ridden this bike quite a bit up to this point. This is one of the best, and it might be the best, adventure bike that I've ever ridden for riding aggressively on the pavement. It's almost unbelievable how this thing rides on like it's on rails. It's got to be something to do with the chassis setup, uh, the suspension setup. I'm not really sure, but for an adventure bike with a big front wheel and, and semi knobby tires, this thing is like it's on Velcro to the road and it transitions so fast and you have confidence to ride this bike pretty much at 1010. So fully all the way as fast as you can safely feel that you can go, this bike has your back. Uh, the handling is simply unbelievable. It's just superb. Now, how are the brakes? The brakes are also phenomenal. You've got these monoblock M50 calipers, which are some of the best calipers in the business. The brakes are also maybe some of the best I've ever used on an adventure bike. They're super powerful, but they're also pretty easy to modulate. Let's talk a little bit about the engine. So it's not super fast and it doesn't quite feel like 110 horsepower, but I think that's because the engine is very smooth. It doesn't vibrate because it's that L-twin, that 90 degree design. Uh, the power delivery is smooth and the bike is so refined that you end up going really fast. It just doesn't feel super fast. It doesn't accelerate quite as hard as a KTM 890 because uh, I own that bike, I can I can say that. But it's probably just as fast, it just doesn't feel quite as brutal with the acceleration or quite as strong. But it's still fast. It's a pleasure to rev the engine out. The engine's pretty quiet. I, I wish it was a little bit more noise from the engine. The throttle response, no matter what mode you use, even in a sport mode, the throttle response, there's no jerkiness, there's no abruptness. It's The fueling is perfect on this bike, off-road and on the road. The thing is with this bike, it just begs you to keep going faster and faster and faster. And it doesn't have sort of the downsides that most adventure bikes do. It doesn't feel cumbersome or weird or tippy on roads like this. And it just begs you to just go like hell. And because of that, it's about the most fun I've ever had sport riding on an adventure bike. All right, I've been filming for four or five hours. It's getting dark. I'm trying to wrap up my day. And there's a couple things that are starting to get on my nerves about this bike. One is something you can hear right now is the wind buffeting. The wind noise is really bad. Like it didn't seem too bad at first. But the more miles I've put on it at these sustained speeds of like 60, 65, 70 miles per hour, which isn't even that fast, honestly, the wind, the wind blast is pretty, pretty deafening. It's, it's loud. Like I need to wear earplugs really badly uh, to ride this bike. So that's kind of a major bummer. It kind of reminds me of the Norden 901. If you guys saw my review about that bike. The other thing is the seat. So the seat I've been riding for like, yeah, four or five hours and after about two hours, I was uncomfortable. The, the padding on the seat doesn't seem to be very good. It's not very supportive. It's a little bit too narrow as well. So the seat's not going to be very good for riding all day for most people, unfortunately. So those are two definite downsides that I see. All right, let's ride the Ducati Desert X at night. Now, a lot of people have asked, how is this bike to ride at night? So we're going to go through that. So you can see the uh, running lights here, sort of the the parking light on those headlights looks really cool. 
see the LED tail light here pretty bright pretty kind of cool design there of course license plate light now let's jump on the bike and talk about a couple of important things First thing I want to go over is that the switch gear is not illuminated. That's a big disappointment to me. This is a premium motorcycle, high price. They should have illuminated a switch gear because sitting here right now, it's almost totally dark and I can't tell really what's cruise control, what's the mode buttons, where's my heated grip switch, where's my ABS switch, uh, turn signals, horn, it's all just dark. So the headlights on this motorcycle, I would say they're above average. They're, they're pretty good. You can see there's quite a bit of light going down the road here on the low beam, pretty good spread to the sides as well. Now you have to keep in mind that motorcycle manufacturers cannot just make super bright lights. It's illegal, it would blind other drivers. So they have to work with a lot of constraints. I'll show you the high beam here just after we uh, pass this car. Okay, so there's the high beam. So the, I, if it was me, I would adjust that and I know there's a way to adjust it. It seems pointed a little bit too low, but you can see the difference uh, there. Uh, you still get pretty good fill light to the sides, but then you get more out in the distance. But that needs to be aimed higher, in my opinion. So, and all the other thing you don't have with the Ducati, you don't get a cornering light function. Some of the premium motorcycles, not really at this price, you have to go up to like the Tiger 1200s and the GS 1250s. They will have a cornering light that steers through the corner. So this bike, when you lean it over, the light, you know, you have that cutoff, which makes it hard to ride a motorcycle at night in the corners if you've ever done that. All right, so I think it's very, very important that we talk about maintenance and ownership of this Ducati Desert X. When I asked for questions, one of the most common questions I got from you, the audience, was, you know, how is this bike going to be to maintain? Is it going to be super expensive and difficult? So let's jump into this right now. I want to start by talking about the air filter. Now, on an off-road motorcycle, if you ride dirt bikes or dual sports or even adventure bikes in dusty conditions, you already know that your air filter gets fill filled with dirt every day or two on a very dusty kind of ride. So it's important to be able to, you know, get in and change your air filter. Now, one thing that does definitely affect this is where the intake is located on the bike, where the air intake tubes are. So on the Desert X, the air intake tubes are actually up by the headlight, um, kind of uh, between there and the forks, which is a great position uh, to get cleaner air. Uh, on my KTM 890, they put the air intake back here and it sucks up a lot of dirt from the rear wheel. So the air intake is in a good place. However, that's where the good part ends. The bad part is on this bike, because it uses the 90 degree V-twin engine, for packaging reasons, they're forced to put the throttle bodies and the air box between the valley of the two cylinders. And guess where that happens to be? It happens to be under the fuel tank. So in order to service the air filter on the Desert X, which in my opinion is a regular maintenance item which has to be done fairly often if you ride off road in the dust you're going to have to pull the entire fuel tank off and in fact the owner's manual of this bike which I've read cover to cover just to do my research here they say that you have to take the bike to the dealer to service the air filter now that doesn't sound right to me to be brutally honest because I've owned tons of off-road bikes adventure bikes taking my bike to the dealership just to clean my air filter is not acceptable to me now let's move on from that. Let's talk about oil changes. So oil changes, a uh, 9,000 mile oil change interval is what Ducati is saying. That sounds like a long time, but you know what? Modern oils and modern engines have come a long way, so it could very well be correct. Now, of course, in, a, in the service manual, I mean, sorry, the owner's manual, again, they don't give you any information about how to change your oil. Uh, most of the motorcycles I've owned in the manual, it will change, tell you how to do a basic oil change. Even the BMWs, late model BMWs that I've had, they tell you how to change the oil. So I find that to be kind of strange. Now let's talk about one of the elephants in the room, not the Kajiba elephant that we mentioned earlier, but the actual metaphorical elephant, which is the valves. So yes, it does have the Desmodronic valve train. What is a Desmo valve train or Desmodronic? Uh, it's basically a different way that they actuate the valves. And it, it, it was designed a long time ago as a way to get around issues with um, higher valve speeds. But because of advances in technology, it's actually not needed anymore. And they could just use regular uh, cams and shims and things like that. But they've decided to stick with Desmo as part of their tradition. So anyway, what's the point for you? Well, the point is 18,000 miles or 30,000 kilometers is the valve inspection interval on this bike. So that's pretty long. You won't have to do it very often. For some people that could be a very long time, depends on how many miles you ride. But being a Desmo service, it's a bit more complicated than doing normal valves. And for 
99% of people you're gonna end up taking into the dealership. The cost estimate that I've kind of looked up for a Desmo service on a bike like this is gonna be somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500 US. So you're gonna to have to factor that in. If you're uh, able to get your hands on a service manual, which they don't actually seem to provide anymore, which I'm about to talk about in a second, then maybe you could do it yourself, but 99.9% .9 of you, you're gonna be doing that at a dealership. Now, I don't want this to become a big video about right to repair because that's a very controversial, very hot button issue. I certainly have my opinion on it very strongly. You can probably tell how I feel. Uh, but I, I will say that Ducati, to be quite frank, seems to be one of the brands that is less friendly to uh, sort of owner maintenance or right to repair kind of issues. So to back up what I'm saying, the owner's manual doesn't even tell you how to adjust the chain tension. And that's crazy to me because all new motorcycles with the chain, they stretch, especially these adventure bikes because of the suspension movement. And you just tighten the chain tension a little bit every so often. It takes like five minutes to do. But they don't even tell you how to do that in the owner's manual. It says you have to go to the dealer. The other thing, I mean, we talked about the air filter issues, the uh, oil change issues. They don't tell you how to do that. They, they basically won't tell you how to do anything. And to make it worse, if you want to buy a service manual, they won't sell service manuals. So in the old days, we'd all buy service manuals for our bikes. We'd work on our bikes. Now it seems like they're going away from that. Now Ducati, I'm not calling out Ducati on this because other manufacturers are doing the same thing. BMW is kind of going down the same path. It's deeply concerning. That's not what this video is about, but I did want to bring this up. Let me know what you think down below in the comments about this issue. Just something to keep in mind with the Desert X. I don't think everything I've said just now is gonna affect most people because most people have their bikes maintained at a mechanic or dealership, but it would affect somebody like me and my potential decision to buy or not to buy a bike from this, from this brand because I do all my own maintenance here. All right, let's briefly cover the pros and cons to the Desert X. Now I've covered a lot of these throughout the video, so I'm gonna gloss through these really fast. What are the pros? The pros to me, uh, the refinement, the overall build quality, the quality of all the components, how smooth the engine is, there's no vibration. It overall seems like a very high quality motorcycle and definitely worth the money. Another thing I really love about it, the suspension is amazing on this bike. Very, very good for a stock motorcycle. It's supportive, but it's also plush at the same time. In the same vein, the brakes are amazing. Great power, great feel. Another thing I really like is the electronics package. Very good customization of all the rider modes, how everything comes up on the screen, how you can configure things. They hit a home run on the electronics. And I kind of showed this in the ride video, but the handling for a Adventure bike with a 21 inch front wheel on the street through the twisties as a sport bike. This thing is incredible. I don't think I've ridden a bike with a 21 inch front wheel that handles anywhere near this. So props to Ducati for doing that. What are the cons to the Desert X? Again, we've already kind of covered some of these. I feel that they should have made the windshield adjustable because you get a lot of wind buffeting and there's no way to adjust it. Some of the competition have adjustable windshield. That's something I would like to see. A small nitpick is the TFT is just a little bit small. Maybe if it was just an inch bigger, that'd be a little bit more legible for people with not perfect vision. The maintenance kind of concerns and, and, and issues, we've talked about that, so I'm not gonna go through that again. A couple other cons that I have, we've, we've covered the wind buffeting, uh, the seat. The seat was not very comfortable for me. After about 90 minutes, maybe two hours, uh, the padding just seemed too soft and the seat seemed a bit too narrow. So I don't think it's an all day seat for most people. So keep that in mind in terms of aftermarket upgrades down the road if you're gonna buy this bike. And the final con that I have, and we've kind of touched this a little bit, it's just the high cost of accessories and parts. So we talked about the protection package at $1,500. Some of the other stuff, I find the exhaust systems from Ducati to be especially, I don't want to say overpriced because that's probably unfair, but $2,000 for a slip-on pipe, I don't know about that. Like I bought a Wings exhaust, full titanium for my KTM. Actually, I have one on my 690 and my 890. Uh, they're 500 bucks and they're just as good a quality as this in my opinion. So I don't know where they're getting the pricing from. It seems like a lot. So anyway, the point is Ducati accessories, pretty expensive. All right, so what are the competitors to the Desert X? What should we be comparing it to? Now, I could probably have 30 minutes just on this segment and we can't do that. So here's how we're gonna handle it. I prepared a little um, downloadable uh, spreadsheet that I'm gonna put linked down below in the video description. So if you wanna download that, please do. It compares the Desert X and the specs to all the different, all of its uh, direct competitors in the midsize adventure marketplace. I think there's like six or seven bikes on there. So please download that, take a look at that. It has everything I'm about to talk about. And I also rank the bikes in terms of what I feel, what bikes I feel have the best suspension. I also rank them in order of, of the bikes I feel are best off-road and best on-road. They're totally subjective and they could change at any time as I do more testing, but I wanted to put something out there to kind of give you some sort of a buyer's guide 
because I like to do that on this channel. So the Desert X sits in this mid-size adventure bike uh, category. So you've got the Tiger 900, you've got the FA50 GS, you've got the KTM 890. Uh, if you go down, you could see something like the Touareg 660, although that's a little unfair because it's a much smaller engine, less power. I didn't include the Tenere 700 in my little spreadsheet because that's not fair. It's a, it's a budget bike. It doesn't have any of the features of these higher end bikes. So what are the standouts on a Ducati? Well, I think the styling is going to get a lot of people. The overall build quality, the quality of the components, the handling, the suspension, as an overall package, this is definitely, I think, maybe the best executed and most overall refined of all the midsize adventure bikes that I've tested. And I think I've tested them all, at least all the popular ones. The difficult thing about making a recommendation on which bike you should buy is that everybody has different needs, different desires. Some people value reliability more, some people value performance more, styling, whatever it is. So anyway, download the chart that I have below, take a look, um, put questions in the comments below, but I really don't wanna spend any more time on this because we could get crazy into the deep dives. There's some things that set the Ducati apart, and other bikes have their strengths and weaknesses as well. But if you chose a Ducati, I, I guarantee you, you're not gonna be disappointed in terms of its performance, it's amazing. Final thoughts on the Ducati Desert X. No exaggeration, this is one of the best overall motorcycles, not just adventure bikes, but motorcycles, I've ever ridden, tested, or reviewed. Ducati absolutely did their homework in every single aspect of this bike, and from a performance, from a riding perspective, there's almost zero to complain about. I'm extremely impressed that Ducati was able to pull something like this off after really not making off-road or adventure bikes for the most part throughout its entire history. Whether or not this is the right mid-size adventure bike for you, it's gonna depend on your personal preferences and needs and what kinds of things you look for in a motorcycle. And I hope that by providing a longer format review like this, that I'm providing that kind of consumer advice that helps you make a better informed decision. Now, if you have questions, comments, concerns, if I missed something, please put that down below and let's have a discussion about all this stuff down below in the comments section. Other than that, I sincerely hope you found this video useful. If it was, please support Big Rock Moto, and there's a lot of ways to do that in the video description and comments below. Other than that, please ride safe, and I'll see you out there.